before our next witness provides testimony, I'd like to, represent, to recognize Representative Graves of Louisiana to say a few introductory words about Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with uh, Dr. Secretary Sean Wilson now uh, for about 15 years. And I think we've, we've uh, uh, gone through nights and nights, uh, completely sleepless, uh, going through hurricanes, dealing with all sorts of challenges, and uh, just a, an honorable man that I've, I've, I really do uh, appreciate the opportunity to work with him. Um, uh, he inherited a heck of a problem, and I'd say probably decades and decades of, of underinvestment in our infrastructure. And uh, while he doesn't always agree with me, uh, I, I will say that, that he's taken on some of our toughest challenges and um, made, some, made some great progress on some of the, the, the issues in South Louisiana. Very proud to have him as the leader of AASHTO this year. And uh, I, I want to say again, a uh, good man, good friend for, for a very long period of time, and, and very, very accomplished and skilled uh, le lead of a, of a state DOT. And uh, most importantly, I do call him and, and uh, Rocky, his wife, my friends, uh, Dr. Sean Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Graves. Now I'd like to recognize Mr. Carter for yet another introduction of Mr. Wilson. Mr. Carter, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Chairwoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Uh, so proud and honored to get a chance to introduce my friend, colleague, uh, and a superhero in Louisiana, Dr. Sean Wilson. Uh, Dr. Wilson was appointed Secretary of Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development by Governor John Bell Edwards on January 11th, 2016, after more than 10 years uh, of executive service to DOTD. Since his appointment, Dr. Wilson has been a tireless advocate for new revenue, maximizing federal dollars available to Louisiana advancing a balanced and comprehensive transportation policy for Louisiana and ensuring the department is more collaborative in its working at every single level. Uh, we stay in close communication, especially with the rollout of the infrastructure law and its funding. He has a demonstrated commitment to serving people of Louisiana and building a strong underlying transportation infrastructure that is meant to last. Dr. Wilson earned a BA in urban and regional planning from University of Louisiana and holds a master's in public administration degree, as well as a PhD in public policy from the Nelson Mandela School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Southern University. Sean and his, and his wife, Rocky, reside in Lafayette, Louisiana. They have two children, Sean Wilson, Arsenault, Mike, and Joshua. Uh, they recently welcomed their first granddaughter, Layla Rose. Uh, and we are so incredibly proud, as you can tell by the dual introductions, the bipartisan introductions, uh, the mutual respect that we have for this incredible leader. Uh, welcome, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carter. Mr. Wilson, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis, Chair DeFazio, and of of course, the congressman from the district I, rep I grew up in, Congressman Carter, and uh, Congressman Graves that I've worked with as a co-worker and as a constituent. Um, it's exciting to be with you today and appear at this very important committee about roadway safety and the crisis facing this country. Um, as Secretary of DUTD and President of AASHTO, uh, we stand with you in this commitment to safety. For far too long, we've seen tragic loss of life on our nation's roads and streets and the recent significant increase in traffic fatalities is extremely disheartening. The good news is, thanks to your leadership and the Congress that passed the IIJA, we're seeing an increased level of federal support to state DOTs and our local partners as we combine efforts to provide safe, equitable, and sustainable transportation systems for our nation. We're grateful that the IIJA aligns with state DOT and AASHTO priorities by maintaining a strong federal core aid highway program, including the Highway Safety Improvement Program that Chair DeFazio spoke about. The increase in funding and flexibility for HSIP will allow states to expand their efforts to identify and implement roadway improvements that will address daily tragedies occurring on roads, be they state or local. In addition, the new Safe Streets for Roads and Roads for All grant program provides opportunities for states and other stakeholders to work together collaboratively to address traffic safety throughout the planning, design, 
operation, and maintenance of all public roads. As AASHTO president, I'm leading two emphasis areas that are central to our work in roadway safety, creating pathways to equity and partnering to deliver. State DOTs are not only identifying ways to strengthen our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and equity with respect to our staffing, organizations, and business practices, we're also working to enhance the decision-making and investment processes and practices to positively impact the transportation network. As we expand our efforts to collaborate with traditional and non-traditional partners, we're continually identifying new opportunities and partnerships to work together to improve safety in every state and every community. These emphasis areas enhance AASHTO's traffic safety efforts by providing a focus on citizens, communities, and neighborhoods that have not historically received the needed safety investment by elevating our partnerships with a range of stakeholders to improve safety for all roads. I'd also like to highlight specific policies within the IIJA that will enable and strengthen DOTs to actively and work specifically in improving safety infrastructure. The principles of the safe systems approach include acceptance of the shared responsibility for preventing serious crashes and roadway fatalities by proactively providing a transportation system that accounts for human mistakes, that reduces the impact of energy to the human body, and provides redundant protections for all road users to create a safe system. For example, in Louisiana, we've taken a proactive approach to reducing the potential for cross-median crashes on our high-speed divided highways that routinely result in deaths. We realize motorists can and will make mistakes which lead to roadway departure crashes when traveling at rates of speed. Due to the success of this innovation, we've deployed cable median barriers systematically to install them across the state that's resulted in a 33% reduction in cross-median crashes. Very safely, safely said, cable barriers save lives. States are identifying ways to incorporate equity into their safety analysis to better meet their individual roadway safety goals. In Louisiana, we've recently completed a statewide pedestrian crash assessment prior to IIJA. The risk factors identified included not just the average daily traffic or section length or population density, but we added the percentage of households with no vehicles, the percent of households below the poverty line, the percent of unemployed, and median household income and distance to school and work and the types of shoulders that exist. We wanna highlight that 35 states plus Puerto Rico have adopted complete street policies, as has Louisiana, where we've established a new engineering design position that provides expertise in the design of pedestrian and bike facilities. Louisiana uses complete streets approach to make improvements on non-motorized facilities on all roadway projects where practicable by working with our advisory council. Every state DOT and the nation in AASHTO stands with this committee and the administration and their unwavering support to do everything to make our roads safer. It's an honor to be with you this morning and I look forward to an engaging discussion and answering your questions, Madam Chair. Uh, first to uh, Mr. Wilson, um, you testified uh, in, in your testimony that st state DOTs are all in on safety for all users. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, AASHTO also uh, resists any attempts at, um, shall we say, dedicating directly money and uh, impinging upon their flexibility. And I find it very disturbing that 21 states despite this massive increase in fatalities, chose to transfer funding out of the Highway Safety Improvement Program in 2021. Can you tell me what the senior leadership and others at AASHTO are doing to perhaps um, put a little pressure on these states to stop transferring money out of the safety program, which could save lives uh, while they're seeing an increase in fatalities? Chairman DeFazio, thank you for the question. Um, and, and I would assure you that in every mission and intent of every secretary that I've ever worked with, safety is paramount. Um, that does create choices at the local level, which is why flexibility has been of value uh, for states to use. And we trust that 
uh, they will continue to make decisions. And with regards to redirecting funding, um, I would call your attention to mandates and directives and legislative authorities that states have to work with in terms of satisfying their governors, their legislature, and the publics uh, in their various processes and what that flexibility allows. Um, the core of your question, I believe, speaks to what AASHTO is doing to help uh, focus and prioritize elements of safety and principles of how we operate. Um, what we've done at AASHTO is continue to provide education. Uh, we continue to provide uh, information and best practices on what's happening. Um, I will be the first to tell you that every state is going to do it equally. What we do in Louisiana uh, is spend more on issues of safety than what we're required to do. We spend more on local roads than what we're required to do. Um, but that's a commitment that Louisiana has made. Um, and so AASHTO does not have that authority, unfortunately, to direct every state. And we appreciate Congress's effort and intentions on directing and placing dollars in priority where they do. Um, I will assure you, though, that the dollars that are being spent are addressing comprehensive issues um, and safety. And I think what may be moved to another program, if it's safety dollars, uh, it can still benefit in that other program from a safety purpose and a mission. So um, with, with respect to that, I would, I would offer you that AASHTO remains committed and we're happy to continue to have conversations on uh, how we might be more aggressive in that space. We don't reject uh, that opportunity or that role. Well, uh, congratulations on what your state is doing. Unfortunately, there are 21 other states that uh, aren't uh, putting more money into safety than they're being allocated. I now recognize Mr. Crawford for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. In light of the topic of this hearing, I want to first offer my condolences uh, to those who lost loved ones in the devastating collision that occurred just two days ago in my district involving a C.B. King Memorial School bus. This tragedy took the lives of five of my constituents and injured five others. My prayers are with those who are grieving and, and I'm reminded of the urgency today to keep our roadways safe. Um, let me start my first question and direct this to Mr. Wilson. Um, how are state and local governments taking into account the current supply chain challenges that we're facing now, the need to move freight efficiently as they consider design projects like the adoption of bike lanes, narrowing vehicle travel lanes to accommodate bike lanes may be beneficial to cyclists, but how should state and local governments weigh that against the importance of moving critical goods like medicine, groceries, and baby formula? Thank you, uh, Congressman Crawford. I will, I will tell you that states have robust planning efforts that engage not just uh, a single stakeholder. So when we look at our state transportation plans that require freight plans where we identify those corridors that are focused specifically or intentionally on freight, um, we factor in safety in those implementations or those designs. And so we recognize the need to move freight on our systems. We all support a multimodal system in terms of infrastructure. Um, and we also have to factor that into safety, whether it's the opening remarks around truck parking and not only the shortage and the safety, they also have remnants of uh, deterioration on our system in terms of creating unsafe shoulders or drop-offs and things of that nature from where they park. So um, our statewide transportation plans, first and foremost, should address the long-term implications of how freight moves. With regard to the supply chain issues and what's happening with us, all the DOTs are monitoring uh, those materials and the impacts on our projects. And so you can take something as simple as uh, plastics and striping and other materials that are necessary for safety type projects. Uh, the slowdown that we're seeing delays the ability to make a difference on those projects, whether they're roundabouts, signage, J turns, you name it. Uh, the, the delays in, in either cables for cable barriers, all of those are factors that contribute to the ability of a state to implement projects that have already been proven, have been scientifically justified, and have advanced to the planning stage where we can no longer uh, implement it immediately. And so that delay creates an opportunity for another death and another accident. Gotcha, let me shift gears real quick. I wanna, I wanna get your thoughts on this, Mr. Wilson, but also Ms. Williams, I'd like to get your opinion as well. And Mr. Wilson, you mentioned in your testimony that rural roadway fatality rate is roughly twice the urban fatality rate. Can you expand a little more on how the Federal Highway Administration can work to make the guidance and technical support for the safe system approach meet the needs of rural areas like the district that I represent? 
So, you know, I think the context sensitive approach to understanding what the cause is and looking at the countermeasures that are available and are applicable in those environments will require uh, different type of elements. And so for us in Louisiana, you might see center line rumble strips uh, as opposed to just on the edge lines. You may see uh, a wider striping or even a smaller striping depending on uh, the capacity of the road and whether or not shoulders exist. And so uh, states have that flexibility to be very context focused to understand the problem and understand what's causing those accidents. And if they're correctable, we will apply them uh, appropriately where the problem exists. So what happens in rural America doesn't necessarily suffice in urban America and vice versa. Sure. And uh, the data will speak for itself as well as the implementation tools that states have flexibility to apply. Uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, it seems that data is paramount when determining where and how to spend our safety dollars. Uh, how does data inform decisions and investments related to highway infrastructure? Very good question. Data is absolutely essential uh, for us to make the most informed and strategic safety decisions as to where we apply uh, solutions that have been proven to work. Um, with IIJA and their investment in the ability for us to collect that, uh, Louisiana and other states are doing a great deal of work in working with locals uh, to understand what's happening to ver vulnerable uh, road users, non-motorized users on the local system as well as the state system, and making that data more accessible uh, to be able to be used and uh, applied to projects is absolutely essential, whether it's with tribal communities and territories or local governments to have the transparency of information to make the most informed decisions is paramount to uh, saving lives and protecting people. No different than what uh, Mr. Gaines shared in terms of looking at intersections and where you see historic uh, repeat accidents, the data should drive the actions of a state as it relates to making safety decisions. Well, data's long been used to, to make decisions when it comes to highway improvements. I mean, we have traffic studies in my home state of Illinois. When we're begging for roadway improvements, they'll do the studies, they'll use that data. Um, as, as you see, you know, more and more federal tax dollars invested in data collection. My, my concern is, and I would like to know from you, where is that data that can be used by our local DOT in the state of Illinois or elsewhere in the country or local governments, where is that sourced from? So the, the, the data where it's sourced from, it's, it's sourced from those communities. It's sourced from the accident reports. It's sourced from uh, vehicle data that we see. And so it shows up in our regular highway priority program. So when we actually roll out a capital program, as I know uh, Secretary uh, of Illinois, when they roll out their program, they've spent the time to look at data to make a constrained decision based on the resources that are available and focus the accidental um, focus the resources where the accidents are and or make the improvements that the data says it's going to have the biggest impact as opposed to not. So it's, that's not real-time data. That's kind of more data research. Well, I think it's data research, but there's an evolving uh, element of data collection. So from a traffic standpoint, we use these cell phones now to tell us where people are. Uh, you can triangulate that with existing data that we've collected historically on our system and be very predictive. We're looking at uh, predictive analysis on where we will see accidents so we can best position uh, from a traffic management standpoint, vehicles to be able to remove them, but also to be able to use education and to notify people uh, ahead of them approaching a situation where there's a potential for rear ends or side swipes, whatever it may be. Well, I'd love to work with you and, and uh, all the witnesses as we move forward into more of a real-time data collectability uh, atmosphere here within traffic safety. So look forward to working with you. Thanks for answering my questions. I yield back. Thank you. Current estimates are that nearly 43,000 people died in motor vehicle traffic crashes last year, a 10 and a half percent increase from 2020. This is more than just cars crashing into one another. Pedestrian fatalities are also on the rise. Bicycle fatalities are on the rise and also motorcyclist fatalities are on the rise. These increases reflect not just the inherent risks of driving, but the very design of our roadways. Federal regulations and improvements in vehicle design have made it safer to be inside of a vehicle. Now we must apply the same commitment to safety for people outside of vehicles. 
Safe roadway and community design is an essential part of reducing these rising deaths and designing streets for safety must be a priority. While pedestrian safety impacts all Americans, the risks are not evenly distributed. According to a recent Governor's Highway Safety Association study, Black children ages 4 to 15 had the highest rates of fatalities involving pedestrians as a percentage of all motor vehicle traffic fatalities. Dr. Wilson, are you familiar with these statistics? And if so, how do you explain them? Congressman Johnson, I am familiar with those statistics. Uh, it is not much different than what we're seeing in Louisiana in terms of where our crashes and fatalities are occurring. I think the difference or the reason why we're paying more attention to it is because of the focus that uh, this administration and IIJA have placed on looking at equity in terms of how it impacts uh, humans and lives. And so, as I mentioned to you with our highway safety program and uh, in previous testimony here today, I've indicated ways in which we are looking at communities and are assessing data based on demographics where we can now look at what's happening in a community that has uh, historic poverty levels or has uh, historic access. And we see the gaps in our system as it relates to sidewalks or lighting or other elements that will make it safer for those citizens. So uh, it is in fact alarming. And I think we owe it to communities to equitably distribute our safety dollars, uh, to equitably, equitably distribute our capacity dollars and everything else so that we have a comprehensive system. And so where we can invest in pedestrians and bicyclists in places where we have not, we absolutely should and unfortunately, the data is pointing us in the direction of those communities of color or communities of consistent poverty where we're having the greatest impact on losing lives. And that just perpetuates their problem from a financial perspective and the impact on those families. Thank you. Tell me what uh, can be done to uh, change road design from prioritizing speed to safety. Um, I will tell you from, from a national perspective, um, engaging in, uh, in active conversations with stakeholders is absolutely essential. Uh, the updates to the MUTCD are absolutely essential. And then empowering engineers to be able to make decisions uh, at the state level and at the local level that will allow for uh, engineering judgment to uh, apply itself appropriately. We've had several situations in Louisiana where there have been requests for speed and reductions, and we do data and we look at the assessments, um, but that's only a part of the equation. We also have to look at land use. You have to look at what access management authorities exist, and that oftentimes will uh, be given to the local governments as opposed to a state government. And so that has to be a collaborative conversation, one in which we look at the data collectively, and then that we understand our responsibilities. And that's the value of a safe systems approach, is it's going to share responsibility for ensuring people are safe, uh, and such that it's not just about speed, it's about enforcement, it's about design, it's about education, it's about awareness, it's about land use decisions, and that is something that is universal across the country when it relates to infrastructure. You know, Mr. Wilson, is, as you know, the national uh, shortage, the national shortage of parking is a safety crisis. Uh, there's been dozens of studies, including surveys by numerous states and two from the U.S. DOT that has confirmed there simply isn't enough parking for the number of trucks on the road. USDOT's most recent report on the issue found that the shortage that the shortage is a problem in every state and every region. Even the most recent report, the administration failed to mention truck parking even once in the, not even once in their national road safety strategy. If a trucker can't find a safe and legal parking spot, they often resort to parking in areas like highway shoulders, entrances and exit ramps. Parking in these locations create a hazard for, for the personal safety of the driver, but also for other motorists. But if a trucker is fatigued or running out of their hours of, of service, they have no other choice than to try to find some place to pull those trucks off. Now, right now, the states could be working to fix this issue with federal money, but unfortunately, DOT's own data shows that few, if any, states are parking or, or creating new parking spaces, and some are even losing those parking spaces. 
So the question for Atto perspective is given this clear need for parking, the obvious safety implementations, and can, so can you talk about why we haven't seen any real truck parking capacity expansions from the states and since USDOT and many other states and many states have identified the parking shortage as a safety hazard, can you discuss what states are doing to try to make uh, progress on this issue? Um, thank you, Congressman, uh, for that question. And I would echo the concerns about uh, truck parking. Louisiana and the I-10 corridor is absolutely critical to uh, freight uh, transportation, and it's a multimodal corridor for our country. Um, I will tell you from a Louisiana perspective, one of the challenges with uh, a state DOT making the investment in truck parking is the potential competition with the commercial side of what we provide for trucking. I can point to several uh, truck stops along I-10 that have expanded the capacity to the point that they're doubling their sizes uh, of that footprint with many more services that are available for the trucker, uh, for that trucking community than what a state would be in a position to provide. That's one aspect. The second aspect of it has to do with this uh, NIMBY approach that we see a tremendous amount of growth and development in residential communities all along our interstate and where they have those opportunities to safely maneuver and interchange, you run into a neighborhood immediately and there's a lot of local resistance to where we have the potential for capacity. Another issue in Louisiana is I do not have the authority to expropriate for parking. I can expropriate for a highway and so even if we wanted to be extremely aggressive in this area and we have a, a commercial trucking position in my department to help work and coordinate with that community, um, we would not be in a position to exercise the full authority that we have to be able to make the types of impacts from a safety perspective. And so we resort to education, we resort to providing information and working with our trucking community, uh, whether it's commercial uh, and or our local trucking community to try and support uh, the trucking demand. And I would advocate and support the idea of having discretionary dollars available for the purposes of doing that, but I think that needs to work with helping the infrastructure expand and not necessarily labor it to a department to be responsible for the entire uh, parking support services that are necessary. Would you be able to uh, get your members to put together some data, data for us? Uh, this is an issue that I've been trying to work on. I came from the trucking industry. I watched this going on. I've also known that uh, early on when we saw a lot of the states actually closing um, uh, rest areas, and that, that was because of the crime rate and everything in that in, in those areas. But if you could get the data to us, so we can... We would, be, we would be happy to do that, and, and we're a state that was in a position of reducing the number of rest areas, not because of crime, but because of development mm -hmm. and the need to not compete with a quarter of a mile down the road interchange that has been placed and is now servicing trucks and commercial services on all four quadrants of that interchange. And so it converges with development, and I think it goes back to this land use conversation mm -hmm. in terms of what communities are doing, but we would be happy at Ashto to share with you some of the challenges that states see and potential solutions that would help uh, deliver more parking sooner rather than later. What can we do to focus more attention resources on tribal roadway safety? Congressman, uh, great question. I think this speaks directly to the uh, ranking members question around data and the transparency of what's available. Uh, state DOTs provide local technical assistance and we work with federal highways to uh, coordinate for those local road assistance programs and highway safety initiatives that will benefit roads uh, adjacent to or near uh, tribal lands. I have experience in Louisiana working with Cachada and other tribes to make improvements and making the best possible decisions for crossing signals, uh, as well as access to other governmental services. But I think it's gonna begin with having a real transparent, uh, coordinated conversation to provide meaningful solutions that we don't necessarily just direct. And I think it's important for us also to be sensitive to the cultural uniquenesses of what happens in tribal communities uh, such that we can be respectful and actually uh, get some things done to, to reduce those numbers. I've run out of time, so Ms. Williams, maybe you can answer the, Ms. Williams, answer the question maybe in writing after the hearing. Thank you so much. I, re I yield back. Aloha, Chair Norton, Ranking Member Davis. Mahalo for holding this hearing to focus on traffic safety and on building safer roads for us all. Traffic fatalities happen in every community, 
across America, including mine, Hawaii's second congressional district. Kaulana Werner was 19 years old and was killed on Farrington Highway, a state highway, in front of his home in Nanakuli on the island of Oahu, where decades of divestment meant that there was no safe sidewalks for pedestrians. This tragedy plays over every day, especially in underserved communities like his. We know that indigenous communities and rural communities continue to have disproportionately high traffic fatalities because of the lack of infrastructure and focus on underserved communities in those investments. This problem continues to grow in Hawaii as well. And in my home state, traffic fatalities have increased 45% from 2021 to 2022, and Hawaii consistently has one of the highest per capita pedestrian fatality rates and an even higher elderly pedestrian death rate. Although Hawaii has decreased its per capita pedestrian fatality rate in recent years, there's more work that needs to be done. We know that there must be increased investment in underserved communities so that we can prioritize planning and investment in safety to neighborhoods that have had decades of divestment. And while the federal government and the U.S. Department of Transportation has embraced a new path forward on roadway design to reduce traffic fatalities, we know that more must be done. I guess my question would be directed to either Ms. Clegg or Mr. Wilson. Interested in your perspective on under-resourced communities, such as indigenous or rural communities, which have some of the highest per capita traffic fatality rates, and how can we better serve the needs of those communities, and what are you seeing in Louisiana or other communities that are underserved um, or often misrepresented? Thank you for that question. Um, I was just talking about this issue with uh, Ed Sniffen from your state at a, at a meeting in Dallas. Um, what state DOTs can do is provide technical assistance to those underserviced and undersourced communities uh, and assist them in the planning, uh, delivery, and the operations after it's built uh, using the best practices and the things that we know that are happening. Uh, I call your attention to the Safe Streets for All program that state DOTs are not eligible uh, to receive, but in my state and in other states, and I've shared this with um, Ed Sniffen, as I said, we are supporting and helping those communities write the grants and build the capacity to be able to make the investments, and then we'll support them in the uh, proper structuring and bidding of that project. Um, the other piece that we do is when it comes to uh, looking at the resources that are allocated in IJA, we are exceeding the 15%, for example, on bridges and are going to be spending about 30% on those bridges that are outside of my program and outside of my authority, uh, whether it's the road transfer program that we are divesting or uh, the local road assistance program. Uh, we would love to be able to make more investments because regardless of what road you're on, if a kid dies on it, mm -hmm. it's a problem. Uh, if there's a crash on it, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, being transparent and being coordinated and collaborative, collaborative in delivering infrastructure is absolutely the smart thing to do. You know, I, I guess I'll use the balance of my time to continue the conversation with Mr. Wilson. Um, maybe the same would be said, I guess, for Louisiana. Many of Hawaii's coastal highways are right next to the ocean, are going to suffer from climate change, already suffering from climate change and... and um, rising sea levels is in the last 28 seconds. What's Louisiana doing to address this? Are we moving roads inland? How are we addressing it? We, we are investing in a resilient infrastructure and IIJA actually created programs that will allow states uh, to be able to make those investments, to elevate those roads, to convert them to some other type of asset that can be used. Um, and we're also thinking about it from a watershed perspective. And so we're spending over $1.2 billion to understand not just the sea level rise issue, but how do we manage water in general? Because we will be in a city and see roads go underwater. And so whether it's flood ele uh, roadway elevation or improved drainage, looking at how we reinstall culverts and uh, restore the public work elements, that's one of the things I'm most excited about 
and IIJA is that it did not designate it just for one type of improvement. It's a comprehensive infrastructure investment program, and that is going to be valuable, whether you're on a bicycle lane and you have standing water at the side of the road, or you have grates that need to be converted so that you can safely ride over them, or on sidewalks. It's absolutely essential. So climate change is real. It's an impact, uh, and it will have implications of safety uh, in spontaneous situations when people will lose their lives, unfortunately, if we don't pay attention to it. Unfortunately, my home state of Texas leads the country in vehicle-related fatalities with 4,480 deaths in 2021. And although, the, although these numbers are impacted by the state's large population, it is still an issue of concern and, de and demands more attention from our Department of Transportation. Like so many negative statistics, traffic fatalities have a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And my congressional district, the city of Dallas, is working to address the issue of safety and accessibility to transportation by reconnecting and revitalizing uh, communities historically harmed by the construction of the highway system and other barriers. But there's still a lot of work to be done in ensuring equity in our transportation system, especially in my home state of Texas. I am pleased that the Infrastructure uh, Investment and Jobs Act included funding for several roadways. I look forward to learning if these programs are working and what else can Congress do uh, to help the to help the Transportation Committee attempt to continue uh, to address troubling increases in some of these uh, fatalities. Representative Johnson, uh, Sean Wilson from Louisiana, um, I will tell you every state has uh, infrastructure potentially that has disproportionately impacted communities of color uh, or low-income communities, and we're excited to see the investment in IIJA for the Reconnecting Communities. I will tell you it's certainly not enough to do our due justice and due diligence with regards to making a full investment because these projects are going to be uh, eight to ten years in the making. We will need additional dollars and commitment, and I would support uh, full funding of these projects if we are serious about uh, restoring the communities to the condition they were. Uh, it also allows us to make good investment in asset management to better maintain the systems that are built uh, as a priority, and then most importantly, to continue to make investments uh, where we can to ensure that uh, those communities are protected and have the same opportunities for sidewalks and other elements uh, to be able to move effectively if that is their option. There may not be a position or a potential for them to drive or have cars, so we are committed as an association, as a state, uh, to making that happen. Mr. Wilson, state agencies that receive highway safety improvement program funding are required to have approved comprehensive and data-driven strategic highway safety plans. I agree that there is a need for a commitment to transportation equity. As you know, I proudly sponsor the Transportation Equity Act, which will help address transportation equity issues. What additional resources are needed for states to make strides towards transportation equity? So with specific regard to um, data and management, the one thing I think that's needed is consistency in policies. I think there is some uh, potential conflict and we're working with federal highways to reconcile uh, the points between uh, highway safety plans and the state improvement plans uh, as a result of IIJA so that we can have a consistent expectation of what's deliverable. Um, the, the second thing with regards to equity, I think the most important thing is having an obvious framework that can be consistently applied um, in a state that respects the uniquenesses of that state. So for um, Louisiana, I don't expect the same uh, statistics or elements of equity to apply as they would perhaps in Idaho or some other western state, but the framework of identifying those categories and those sectors and then applying practices where there's voids, I think that is the best possible way to uh, ensure consistency of uh, safety measures from an equity standpoint uh, across communities. It needs to be reflective of that state and the populations that they serve. My question will be to um, the 
president of the Association of State Highway um, and Transportation Officials, uh, Mr. Wilson. Um, if you don't mind, I, Secretary Wilson, I introduced HR 1967, which will allow Puerto Rico to issue commercial driver's license um, to commercial truck drivers. And um, I know you as a Secretary of Transportation, you know how important it is and um, having up to eight, uh, 80 hours of classroom time, third party testing, uh, driving hours and reading test and, and additional schooling uh driving and education for the six additional endorsements for driving um given the numbers of deaths uh, that occur on the roads each year uh, isn't it essential that uh, commercial drivers have their uh, cdls which raise equality in drivers standards at the same time i had a hard time hearing but i think the question was around uh, the consistency of uh, the qualifications and training necessary for CDLs. And I think absolutely that training is essential. Uh, I think it needs to be updated and modernized based on what we're seeing in our system, whether it has to do with technologies or new design elements or other factors uh, that will contribute to safety. And so I'm not sure if I missed uh, the core element of your question. It was a little hard to hear. So if I haven't, if you could maybe succinctly state that and I'll uh, give it another attempt. Thank you. Thank you for, for, for your answer. But uh, I'm, I'm asking, uh, we file a bill, HR uh, 1967, which will allow Puerto Rico to have their own uh, commercial driver's license uh, for commercial truck drivers. We don't have that. Um, and I was explaining to you, uh, you know, in your experience, how, how important uh, this is for education, the testing, um, and the hours uh, of, of classroom time that may allow to reduce the fatalities in, in, in roads. And given this, do you think this will allow to raise the quality of drivers, uh, this kind of CDLs, if it's allowed in Puerto Rico? Representative Gonzalez, I will tell you, I'm not familiar with the language in H.R. 1967, and I will make sure that we supply a written answer after reviewing uh, the text of that to uh, give you a position from AASHTO. Special interest want federal freight funding to go directly to freight without addressing the impacts freight has on local communities. And do you believe federal freight funding should be spent on mitigating safety, air quality, and congestion impacts on freight? And what more can be done to address highway rail grade crossing safety? So I, th I think the question was around um, special interest rail and rail and other elements of um, investing in safety, whether it's railroad crossings. Uh, I, absolutely, I think we, we owe it from a safe systems approach to make the investments in safety wherever it may be. And so uh, we do support those investments. At our, my, in my state, we have a uh, grade separation program. We've got multimodal connector programs. We're also investing uh, from a commercial trucking standpoint to uh, advocate for elements of safety for the commercial trucking units, particularly at our ports and points of entry uh, for freight into the marketplace. So uh, those investments ought to be equally distributed. Um, when I say equally distributed on those issues, uh, but we should be making those advancements because they do play a major part in ensuring that the travelers and vulnerable users are safe uh, who may live in communities adjacent to those as well from a climate standpoint. Uh, we owe it to make those appropriate investments. Well, my district has the Alameda Corps of East, and that has all the major traffic on the ports, Long Beach and Los Angeles, going to deliver to the rest of the nation. And it's highly, highly used. And so it's important for the people because I have sat at a railroad crossing for half an hour waiting for a train that carries over 200 rail cars waiting to cross. And you have uh, road rage, you have people trying to get through, and it's just a mess. We, we have a very similar situation, um, but I will tell you, as a state that has all of the Class 1 railroads operating in them, several communities uh, deal with that impact. And also as a state in the Southeast that has adopted a climate action plan, clearly uh, freight has a role in ensuring uh, environmental soundness in terms of what we do, uh, but it also deals with lives and people uh, because they do allow us to get trucks off the road. And so having a good conversation and relationship with our freight partners 
means being sensitive to what's happening in those communities. There are things that they're doing that are a part of our daily lives and that disruption is challenging. It is difficult and technology can be our friend in terms of noticing and advising individuals when trains are forthcoming uh, and the length of those trains and how long they'll be. And so communicating and coordinating with the rail industry is absolutely essential, I think, in ensuring a good quality of life in addition to a safe uh, life as well. Have you dealt with the railroad? I have had good relationships with all of the railroads, some better than others. Uh, but I would tell you it's a universal experience that um, they've been around a lot longer than many of our highway systems, no different than what happens in the maritime space. Uh, but um, I'll be happy to work with you and share uh, the numbers for the friends who do return our calls and are quick to respond to us, and each of them are, in fact. We give them the uh, land, and uh, now we they don't want to allow for things to happen to uh, promote this kind of safety. I'm sure that uh, we should have something in the works to uh, help mitigate that with the railroad because we uh, we should have the public safety before uh, profit. Absolutely, and whether it's um, safety in terms of climate or safety in terms of uh, mobility and actual vehicles on the road, it's absolutely a part of it. And we just can't lose sight that we, uh, we rely on that freight industry and we rely on those ports and we rely on those trains to deliver everything to us. Everything that we own, buy, sell, or trade has been on the back of a truck or a train or in the uh, hull of a ship. And it's a part of a continuum of service, but coordinating and communicating is absolutely essential. And so I would, I would agree with you that uh, they have an obligation to be good citizens and good neighbors, uh, just as we do to them as good businesses. <laughs>